Today, we will look at the different considerations to take into account when planning a VFR flight. There are many aspects that must be considered, such as the election of the route, the expected weather conditions, the weight and balance of the aircraft, the legal fuel requirements, the aircraft technical status, notams, dangerous goods and special cargo, aircraft performance, among other relevant aspects. Basically, the objective during flight planning is to answer the question, is it possible to perform this flight safely and efficiently? And if so, under which conditions? Now, since we are in the general navigation section of the channel, we will focus only on the route selection and all the considerations related to it. So with this being said, the question now is, how do we choose a route for a VFR flight? Well, the selection of the route will depend on different factors, such as the shortest possible distance, the availability of visual checkpoints, the characteristics of the terrain, the expected weather conditions, restricted prohibited or dangerous areas along the route, air traffic flow and airspace structures, standardized VFR procedures, minimum, maximum, and available VFR cruising levels, the range of the aircraft, and in some cases, the sunrise and sunset times. So, since there are a lot of things to take into account, we will divide this video into two parts. In this first part we will look at the shortest possible distance, visual checkpoints, relief characteristics, weather conditions, and airspace structures. So without any further ado, let's start with the route distance. Clearly, the shorter the route is, the greater the savings in fuel and flight time. In this example, if we plan a direct route between A and B, we obtain a total distance of 50 miles, which, let's say in a small general aviation aircraft, corresponds to 30 minutes of flight time and 5 gallons of fuel. Now, if we plan this same flight, but with a route that passes through checkpoints that are far from the direct route, we will see that the total distance is now greater, in this case, 60 miles. This longer distance implies an increase in flight time of about 6 minutes and one more gallon of fuel. So in summary, when planning a VFR flight, we should always try to plan a direct route. However, this is not always possible. One of the reasons for this is the availability of visual checkpoints along the route. The thing is that, as we are flying VFR, our main reference for navigation are landmarks and other visual references visible from the cockpit. This means that the route to be chosen must contain adequate visual checkpoints at an acceptable distance from each other to avoid disorientation, inadvertent deviation, or getting lost. So if a direct route does not satisfy this requirement, we will have to divide it into several legs in such a way as to ensure the identification of the available checkpoints. Now, as a side note here, the checkpoints do not need to be directly below the intended route, they can be at a certain distance, as long as they are identifiable. With this being said, let's move on to the terrain and relief characteristics. When planning a flight, we must be aware of the capabilities and performance of our aircraft, so when choosing a route in a light general aviation aircraft, mountainous areas, high terrain, and large bodies of water should be avoided. In terms of mountainous terrain, we should try to plan the route along valleys or over low terrain and avoid flying over high mountainous areas. Let's see a practical example of this. Let's say we are planning a VFR flight between these two airports. In this case, if we plan a direct route, we can see that this involves flying over very high terrain, which can reach up to 10,000 feet of elevation, as we can see in the maximum elevation figure of the chart. So with this in mind, and considering that it is a relatively short flight in a small general aviation aircraft, it would be wiser to choose a route around this mountain over lower terrain, which would result in better aircraft performance, a lower probability of controlled flight into terrain, and better conditions in case of an engine failure. Now, with respect to flying over large bodies of water, we must say that it depends on the type of aircraft we are flying. For example, a multi-engine aircraft would not have significant problems with this. However, single-engine aircraft should plan a route that allows them to always maintain a safe distance from shore in the event of an engine failure, so that they can glide all the way to shore. 
In this example, if we plan a direct route between A and B, we can see that in the event of an engine failure in the middle of the route, the aircraft would be too far away from the coast to glide to it. This way, it would be wiser to plan a route along the coast to the destination. Now, the question is, how far offshore can I fly while maintaining an adequate safety margin? Well, to answer this, we have to determine the gliding distance of our aircraft under the current conditions. So, let's say that taking into account the altitude and the wind, we determine that the gliding distance of our aircraft is 15 nautical miles. What this means is that in the event of an engine failure, the aircraft will be able to fly for 15 miles before reaching the ground. Then, with this in mind, the objective is to plan a route that allows the aircraft to keep within 15 miles from shore at all times. In this case, a direct route would take the aircraft out from this limit, so then, it would be better to plan a route closer to the coast. Now, in relation to this rule, there is a big parenthesis, and it is that in some cases, a single-engine aircraft is allowed to fly beyond its gliding distance if it has certain equipment on board, which normally consists of flotation devices for the occupants on board and other related emergency equipment. This is mentioned in the Chapter 6 of the ICAO Annex 6. However, what prevails is the regulation in force for each state. Let's now move on to weather conditions. Bad weather represent a major threat to small general aviation aircraft, especially those not equipped with airborne weather radars. So if adverse weather conditions are known to be present or forecast near the route, these areas should be avoided during flight planning. Sometimes this implies choosing a much longer route, or even cancelling the flight. These decisions should be based on the analysis of satellite imagery, whether radars on ground, SIGMETs, AIRMETs, ASHTAMs, SNOTAMs, PIREPs, surface analysis charts, as well as weather reports and forecasts of the airports that are close to the route. Let's now continue with the considerations related to airspace structure and classification, starting with the restricted, prohibited, and dangerous areas. During flight planning we have to observe carefully the navigation chart, looking for possible conflicts with certain airspaces. Then we will decide whether we want to avoid them and choose another route, or if we want to fly through them, provided we meet the requirements to do so. While making this decision, we have to consider that these airspace structures are 3D, which means that we have to observe not only the lateral limits depicted on the chart, but also the vertical limits of that airspace. If the lower limit is the ground, and there is no upper limit, we are forced to fly through it, or avoid it laterally. However, if there are specific lower and upper limits, we can actually fly above or under it, as we can see in this example. Now, apart from these restricted, prohibited, and dangerous areas, we have to consider as well the general classification of the airspace and the possible traffic flow conflicts that we may encounter in flight. Here for example, we can see that for this flight, we have to consider the outbound traffic departing from this major airport, which is very close to the planned route. So if the traffic flow is very high, it is likely that the ATC will not allow us to cross those departure routes, so we will have to choose a different route. Now, to assist pilots in this process of planning, a controlled airspace structure is normally established around the airport, known as a CTR. A CTR, or control zone, is an airspace structure that extends upwards from the surface to a specified upper limit, usually around one or more airports. The main purpose of this CTR is to protect and control departing and arriving traffic, so that no aircraft can fly through it without an ATC clearance. Now, it is important to mention that it is totally legal and valid to fly through a CTR. However, when talking about VFR traffic flying near one of these airports, normally they are not allowed to enter the CTR, as they may interfere with departing and arriving traffic, especially in very congested airports. So if this is the case, we have to plan a route that goes around this airspace. However, sometimes there is another option. First we have to say that in many countries, CTRs have a single upper limit, and therefore the only option is to fly along the sides, 
or if cleared by ATC, we could fly above it. However, in some countries like the USA, many of these CTRs have the shape of a cake, which allows aircraft to fly below the CTR in certain areas. Here we can see an example of one of these CTRs in Miami, where depending on the area, we could fly below it within a certain range of altitudes. Now, another important aspect is to check the classification of the airspace where we are planning to fly, since for example, in class Alpha airspace, VFR flights are not allowed. With this being said, we will continue looking at the rest of the VFR flight planning considerations in the next video. I hope the information presented was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.